Hello everyone! A couple weeks ago I reviewed a low-budget sci-fi horror movie from 1965 that I thought was surprisingly good. This week we're going to talk about a low-budget sci-fi horror movie from 1965 that's really bad. It's Monster A Go-Go, -Go, directed partly by Bill Rabane, partly by Herschel Gordon Lewis. An experimental space capsule returns to Earth, but the strange evidence surrounding the crash site leaves authorities wondering what happened to its occupant. When shriveled dead bodies start turning up, killed by some sort of creature, scientists begin asking if the missing astronaut has transformed into a homicidal radioactive giant. Someone brought this up in the comments last year. It wasn't a recommendation per se, but rather a suggestion of a fun movie that might make for a fun review. Ask pretty much anyone who's seen Monster A Go Go, and they won't just tell you it's a bad movie, they'll say it's one of the worst movies ever made. So I went into it not sure what to expect, yet prepared for some really inept and or bonkers stuff. But at first, I was a little taken aback. Not because it was good, but because it just it just didn't strike me as that bad. Initially, it seems to have no more than your basic, low-budget genre film issues. Choppy editing, stagnant camera setups, bland acting, exposition dumps from an overdramatic narrator. The most egregious flaw, and you pick up on it immediately, is terrible audio and microphone placement. Oh, and that's all too. Huh? Dr. Schreiber, we're taking Taylor's body back to the hospital. Oh, good. What? Well, I'm about to cancel. Here I am. I'm trying to find an answer. I'm not getting any of this. <laughs> the sound stinks. Either the equipment was bad, or the person in charge of audio was incompetent because everything that could be wrong is wrong. Dialogue is too quiet, or there's an awful echo, there's too much background noise, or you hear too much of the wrong things because the mic was pointed at the floor instead of the actors. I know there's a lot of stuff I missed because I just couldn't understand what people were saying. I did go back later with headphones, and I picked up a bit more dialogue, but the content of what people were saying really didn't become any clearer. Plus, I became aware of all this excess fuzz, beeping, and dog barking in the background. Still, for a little while, it seemed like this was the movie's biggest problem. And as troublesome as bad sound can be, in this case scotching any hope you may have had of keeping up with the plot, it doesn't seem bad enough to merit such a notorious reputation. Surely that's not the only thing that earned it a place on the worst movies ever list. Nope, it isn't. As the movie limps along, it becomes progressively more disjointed and bizarre. And because I wasn't aware of the production history, which I'll get into in a moment, I had no idea why there were these weird tonal shifts, or why the drama about the astronaut's, uh, whatever she is, sister-in-law, and her son that's set up in the beginning was not revisited. There were too many people to keep straight, especially since none of them were developed characters, and then later on it didn't seem to matter because we didn't see them anymore anyway. Throw in scenes where it's too dark to see anything, and scenes that are just totally random, involving characters who pop up once and then disappear. The titular monster, aka Astronaut Douglas, enlarged and hideously transformed by radiation, is played by Henry Height, real name Henry Marion Mullins, who at 7'7 seven seven was named the world's tallest man. Height wears a shiny spacesuit and some bumpy makeup that augments his dazed expression as he stumbles around the set. Whenever the hodgepodge of a script needs to get rid of someone, along he comes to strangle people and, I guess, turn their blood to powder with his radioactive aura. A big deal is made about how horribly mangled the corpses are, but of course we see very little of that. And sadly, the monster struck me as looking like a zombified Abraham Lincoln. And once I got that image in my head, he never had any hope of intimidating me. 
The editing is disastrous, and transitions are almost non-existent, and there are times when the movie skips over key things. For example, in one scene, two scientists are discussing an antidote and a recent lull in attacks, which is news to us. The whole time, the guy's being super sketchy, and then once the assistant leaves, the narrator reveals that the scientist has secretly managed to catch the monster, confine him to the lab, and administer doses of the antidote which have successfully reduced the symptoms and altered the monster's behavior. That sounds like kind of interesting stuff! Would have been nice if we could have seen some of that instead of just being told about it! And on more than one occasion, someone is attacked and dies apparently in the middle of nowhere, but somehow the authorities know about it right away. I don't know, maybe the narrator told them. Speaking of the narrator, this movie rivals Plan 9 from Outer Space for nonsensical narration. What you're about to see may not even be possible within the narrow limits of human understanding. Case in point. Plus, I started to resent the narrator for spoiling some of the deaths. He really likes to suck all the mystery and suspense out of the room. Basically, it's all gobbledygook. Either the movie descended into madness, or I did, trying to follow what was going on from scene to scene. It got a trifle clearer afterward when I did a little research. Mind you, this did not help explain the plot but it did help explain what happened here. Part of the film was directed by Bill Rabane. He has an impressive biography that lists a number of legitimate professional achievements and innovations, so he wasn't some clueless amateur trying to make a movie. Rabane was a Latvian immigrant who came to the U.S. at age 15 and made some great strides on the technical side of filmmaking. In 1963, at age 26, he set about making his own sci-fi film titled Terror at Half Day. It was an independent production with a real crew and real actors, and it started out okay. But then his financial backers pulled out, and once he ran out of money, he was forced to abandon the project, eventually selling all of his footage to Herschel Gordon Lewis. Lewis, a savvy businessman and low-budget filmmaker, is primarily known as a pioneer of the splatter subgenre. His most famous film is 1963's Blood Feast, which is notoriously considered the first gory movie. No, I haven't seen it. In need of a double bill for his own feature, Moonshine Madness, Lewis decided to finish Rabane's movie. Though he kept his own name out of the main titles, he added a lot of material. He wrote new scenes and new dialogue, and I believe recorded the narration himself. The problem is that several actors were now unavailable to come back, and instead of recasting and reshooting, or just scrapping the idea entirely, and starting from scratch, they just added a new group of characters, and all those faces that you spent the last 28 minutes trying to become familiar with and trying to remember, they're never seen again. Except for one actor, who did return, but looked so different that they made him play his character's brother instead, which only adds to the confusion. After its release, Monster Gogo was largely forgotten, and it may have blissfully faded into oblivion were it not dug up in 1993 to be featured in an episode of Mystery Science Theater 3000. Going off of past experience, I'm going to guess that most of you who have seen this movie saw it there. The MST3K cast and crew later said that of all the bad movies they screened, this was the worst. And that's a label that has stuck with the film ever since. I didn't know any of this going in, but now it all makes sense. Well, <laughs> as much sense as it can. Uh, this is basically half one unfinished movie, half a bunch of random stuff that was added a couple years later to try to build a, a storyline. I was going to say a cohesive or coherent storyline, but <laughs> it really doesn't get there. 
I considered the possibility that my newfound knowledge might make me reevaluate the finished product that's happened before, or at least I might be able to understand it better, so I steeled myself and watched it again, this time trying to play pin the tail on the Lewis footage. I'm not sure how successful I was. The entire thing is pretty much the same in terms of film quality, so there's no separating scenes that way, and Rebain didn't exhibit a particular directorial style. So in the end, I figured that 28 minutes in, when the cast changes, is the dividing line. Another clue as to who did what is that much of the later material is also on the frisky side, including some tantalizing ladies close-ups, two prolonged scenes with a go-go dancer and her gropey boyfriend, a thirsty woman who runs out of gas relentlessly hitting on a truck driver, and a random guy listening to the radio while reading something called Nudist Calendar and awkwardly leaning forward so teenage boys in the audience can peek at the centerfold. None of these things gelled with the serious tone and style in the first part of the movie, but they did check out with what I learned about Lewis's later, more exploitative films. So I bet he looked at what he had to work with and said, We can't make it interesting, but we can at least try to make it sexy instead. Obviously, Monster Gogo -Go is a bad movie. So then the question becomes, is it so bad it's good? And my answer is no, not really, because beyond the messiness, randomness, and ineptitude, the movie's real problem is that it's just plain boring. The score is boring, the characters are boring, the story is boring, the monster is boring, the kills are boring, the climax, which is actually a huge anticlimax, is perhaps the most boring sequence of all, and that's the opposite of how it should be. The movie could have redeemed itself if it went completely nuts, but it's just completely nuts in short bursts, with a whole lot of nothing in between. It's only 68 minutes long, yet my mom and I were both more than ready for it to be over. It could have been legitimately spooky, cleverly quirky, or charmingly inept, and I would have been satisfied either way, as long as it was entertaining. But instead, it's mostly just an incoherent snooze fest, and that's the kiss of death for a movie like this. That said, it does have some humorous elements, like the groovy main title song, I did enjoy that, the gangly but lost looking monster, the sequence with the woman who runs out of gas, that was just so, <laughs> it was just so aggressive, it was hilarious. The ludicrous attempt to escalate the danger, to to put things on a citywide scale, and yet they didn't have the budget to make that convincing at all. <laughs> and then yes, there's the telephone ring that's clearly just a person off camera going Monster Agogo -Go has a 1.8 out of 10 on IMDb. 56.3% of reviewers gave it 1 star, but 22.5% gave it 10 stars, so they definitely thought it was so bad it's good. Here's a curious thing, though. Digging a little deeper, I discovered the movie appears to have quite a following in Turkey. For some reason, Turkish IMDb users gave it an average rating of 7.3, with 82.9% of reviewers, that's 540 people, giving it 10 stars, in contrast with just 87 people who gave it 1 star. What's the story with that? <laughs> Why is it so popular in Turkey? Anyway, those are my thoughts on Monster Gogo. -Go. I can't say I recommend it, though you might have fun watching it with a group of friends. That might be the only way to enjoy it, actually. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know your thoughts on this movie if you've seen it in the comments below, and I'll be back soon. Thanks for watching.